really good to be here on Coachers. I do apologize for my... Is it open somewhere? It is. <laughs> okay. Um... <laughs> yeah, it is load shedding. So the, the problem I had was that I didn't have power and that is why I'm a few minutes late. But happened to have my coffee. Hope you guys have your coffee ready as well. And uh, yeah, just really happy to be here. And I even made a joke on Twitter earlier um, that when we bang two rocks together in Africa, it can power a small village. And probably that is a very poor joke, but I'm standing by it. <laughs> Today we're going to be discussing um, king weaknesses and just the, the general uh, problem with not casting early and yeah we I have some beautiful instructive games I'm actually really excited because I stumbled across these games I didn't know if I was going to um, pinpoint this exact concept in games uh, if I'll be able to find them but I did and they have really cool uh, names the names of the game and the first game we're going to take a look at is actually Van Hallam Steinitz uh, versus Kurt von Badelben. Please correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Good evening, Kathy. Yeah, I'm just gonna pull up one more chat and then I will be right there. There we go. Mm. Alrighty. So I'd like to take a look at the whole game. We will start with this one. I do have a few that I really want to get through. I think there's one game that has 12 moves, only 12 moves. Uh, what's this about? This is about king weaknesses. Let me check the, the topic actually of the video because I know that um, I'm going to show you the disadvantages of not castling early because the opening principles, I mean, it's all about <clears throat> getting, controlling the center, developing your pieces and getting your king safe. Probably, are they all the, what, what we, what are you referring to, Kathy, exactly? Explain yourself. King safety, the fundamentals. So advantages of getting your king safe and the disadvantages of not getting your king safe. Kurt's name. Have you nailed it? Bardelaben? Bardelaben. Sorry. I'm working on, on my French. I'm not working on any other European language like German or, or in Dutch. <laughs> okay, let's get going. Um, but all to all the French speakers in the chat, bonjour. And... Uh, Italians, buongiorno. That's that's terrible. I take it back. I take it back. Hey, watching home. All right. So let's begin. Wilhelm Steinitz played white pieces in this game, and it has a name. I know this game has a name or a topic uh, name. How I found it, and they're hilarious. I have never laughed while preparing a lesson in my life. And today I laughed. It is called The Battle of Hastings. So this game took place in Hastings and it's called The Uncastled King equals a lost position. So let's try to prove that right. Huyanant is Afrikaans for good evening. Nice. All right, so we're starting with E4, E5. Knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, and I feel right at home playing this, bishop c5, c3. And we have the Italian. We have the Italian. Which country is Hastings in? Is that a capital of a country? Or is that just a city? I need to work on my geography. England. Hastings in England. You'd know better, right? No Evans Gambit? Do you prefer the Evans Gambit over the Italian? And why is the Evans Gambit not played a lot 
and like a very high level? Is it because it's dubious? You're giving up a pawn of b4. Um, so the Evans Gambit, for those of you who don't know what the Evans Gambit is, is basically, I'm going to use this, putting the pawn on b4, allowing bishop to take on b4, followed by c3, so giving a pawn, that's why it's called a gambit. Bishop goes to a5 or c5, a5, and then followed by castling, and then eventually d4. So the whole point is giving up material in the beginning to gain some kind of spatial advantage, quick development and attack in the center. But here we don't see any of that. All gambits are cool. I agree. What about the scotch gambit? Do you like the scotch gambit? <clears throat> okay, Gary Kasparov played the Evans Gambit, which means over here we can approve, right? Ginsberg played against Steinitz many times. Oh, this, okay. Hey, Mohit. All right, so let's continue. We have c3, knight f6, and d4. Exactly the line that I play. I know it gives up a pawn at some point because here, if I use some arrows again, we have e takes d4, c takes d4, then we have bishop b4, bishop d2. I know there's a knight c3 line, but that gets a little complicated. Um, but let's play through these moves. I'm sure I can make some edits. So we have this. Oh, use the hand. Use the hand. Bishop b4. Okay, all of these were played. And then we have knight c3. Oh, knight c3 was actually played. Um, so here I know there's like knight takes. And then we have castling. And it it gets really weird here so we have something like this and this and then if bishop takes we have bishop a3 and if they take the rook then we have rook e1 and it's completely winning for white so i know that exists so it's not really giving up much so bishop takes bishop a3 and then d6 then I think we have rook c1. Is rook c1 the move here? Nigel Short. We have a game with Nigel Short here. So I prepared a game with Nigel Short. Yeah, with ice. What? <laughs> King's Gambit. No. Don't play the King's Gambit. <laughs> Maybe King's Gambit, yeah. And then I think rook c1. Rook c1 is the move, right? Rook c1. It's just really active because activity of a material, right? Okay, so we have castling. Um, this wasn't the game. We go back to the game. Knight c3. Usually I play something like bishop d2, followed by bishop takes bishop, knight takes bishop. And the nice thing about this is that ooh, we're defending on e4 with the d2 knight and we're defending on d4 with the f3 knight. And the best move here for black is d5. If he does not play d5, I feel like it's just going to be much better for white. Because here, if d6 is just slightly better, white has the center. There's no um, contest for the center here. Castling just as bad. I'm sure here you can play something like e5. I think e5 is the move. And then after rook e8 is castle. <clears throat> okay. So yeah, I prefer this, but I also know there's this, and maybe it's a little bit drawish, because after bishop takes bishop, knight takes bishop, then there's bishop f7, king f7, queen b3, which is nice. You get the king out there in the open, and this is all about king safety. But because it's theory, we're not going to worry too much about the king safety here, because d5, and then the intermezzo that is really important here is knight e5 check. And king has to go to e6. If it goes back, this rook is pretty much doomed here on h8. Hey, chess Chopin, good to see you. Good afternoon. Is it afternoon where you are? Is it not evening? Ooh. <laughs> king e6. And then we take. Then there's like queen f8. Oh, there's a nice, nice trick here that I want to show you. So after this, this, you can trick your opponent by playing knight c3. And knight c3 is glorious because if they take on f2 feeling greedy then you can just castle if knight takes f2 you can castle if rook takes f2 there's knight takes knight and loses a rook 
so that gets really juicy okay but probably a little bit complicated to get into so here he decided to just play knight c3 instead right knight c3 was played and then we have d5 now i'm not too familiar with this line um also not sure if after taking if e5 is a good move here is e5 playable it's probably equal and a line as well because it could be followed by d5 and bishop b5 but maybe you guys know this line a little bit better than i do yeah what's wrong scotch scotch gambit is amazing morphe is, a, is great in this gambit you're talking about the Evans Gambit or King's Gambit? We have a, a game named Polymorphy in this like compilation of games. And it's um, Paul Morphy versus A. Morphy. What's his name? I keep forgetting his name. Because I, I checked out... It's just It just says Morphy versus Morphy. When I, when I open it, I'll see their names. And wow, <laughs> yeah, they're two different morphies, polymorphy. <laughs> okay, so then he took and c takes d4 and bishop b4. Okay, we, we went through this already. So knight c3, d5, and taking, taking. And here we have castles, right? <clears throat> we get the same thing. So if he takes on c3, we have pawn takes c3 again. And then if bishop takes c3, bishop a3, and then we continue with that. So there's a lot of transposing that can happen here. And I really like that about a lot of openings, that you can end up confusing your opponent by playing a completely different move order. And I think that's what top players end up doing, especially against people who know their theory and are tricky players to play against because they, they, really, they really know their stuff. And to be honest, I think... If you haven't been playing for a long time, you can really rely on theory because you just memorize it. But when it comes to experience, that's a different story. That's why top rated players are going to confuse you with a different kind of move order. And if you're not experienced in the lines that you're playing, it will get really complicated. And, and that's where they kind of um, mess up their opponent's thinking and completely confuse them. So here, I know playing black pieces, a lot of French players move on to playing stuff like the Sicilian because a lot of structures are the same. And if you are a comfortable French defense player, you'll feel really comfortable and at home if you were to transpose from the Sicilian into some kind of French and your opponent doesn't know how to handle it. Then of course you're gonna feel a lot more comfortable comfortable because you're gonna know the ideas in the opening. Um, English is difficult. This is all I'm gonna say. <laughs> Am I friends with A.B. de Villiers? Um, so, so South Africa has a lot of people in it. I think 57 million, if I'm not mistaken. So it's, it's tough to say that I, I'm friends with someone who, out of 57 million people, who's, who's really well known. Um, no, I'm not friends with A.B. de Villiers. <laughs> yeah. Queen's Gambit, super opening. You're a French defense player? That's amazing. Promoting the French? Watching home. What is wrong with promoting the French? And hi, Torlek. Scotch Gambit is prime. I will promote the Scotch Gambit until the day I die. His dad? Did his dad play? I can't remember the year. When I saved the game, I just saw... Oh, what was his dad's name? It starts with an A. If it starts with an A, then it probably <laughs> is his dad. Planty knows the line. Who's Planty? I don't know who Planty is. <clears throat> it's my plant. That's who Planty is. <laughs> Everyone knows AB. I know who it is, but I don't know him personally. I'm not friends with him. Okay, so we have Bishop G5 on the board. And I don't think I've ever seen Bishop G5, Bishop E7, Bishop takes, D5, Bishop takes. 
yeah, you guys know here in the Twitch chat that my plant is actually the secret grandmaster who feeds me all the amazing tips and tricks to, to beat top players. Queen takes d5, takes, takes, and then we have rook e1. And already we can see that the exposed king is going to be black's king because white has castled really early. And now it's impossible for black to castle because there's just so much pressure on the e-file attacking the knight that if black had to castle now, then the rook would just take on e7. Um, so here I think the best way to go about it would then be to play something like rook d8 and then rook d7 and trying to protect that knight so that the king can castle. Or playing something like f6 is another thing and castle by hand. So artificial castling is also a thing, stopping the knight from going to e5 and g5, playing king f7, rook e8, rook d8, and then somewhat coming back. But also we're kind of going into an end game and white has an isolated queen's pawn and iqp there on d4 so he has to watch out for those things and the more that white simplifies here it will be bad for his attack but not only that but it will be bad for the iqp sitting on d4 so let's see how he faces this um opening not opening how he how he deals with this position playing systems is easy like london um yeah, out of all the configurations in chess that exist, why would you play the same one over and over and over? The London system, friends. The London system. Why would you play the London system? <laughs> King safety is the first thing we need to evaluate in the position. <clears throat> yep, and these are the different ways we can deal with this uh, very weak king now. Okay, f6 is played. I'm not even looking at the notation. Of course, I never saw these games in my entire life. <laughs> queen e2 just piling the pressure, and already we can see that queen e2, uh, queen e7 is a big threat. King f7 just met by queen takes knight, so <laughs> good question. Alrighty, so queen goes back to d7, but that is not where it ends. We have rook c1, rook c1 and c6. Although is c6 really necessary? What is white threatening here that is forcing black to play c6 in this position? And c6 reminds me of the Paul Morphy game, even though very unrelated, um, the Immortal Opera game where his opponent plays c6 b5. <clears throat> But here we have rook c1 and I don't think rook c1 threatens to capture anything because rook takes c7 is just met by queen takes and I mean there is no attack on the knight because the queen is still defending. So what is the whole point of c6? Is that the best way to go about it? Should black actually play king f7 here? But then there's queen c4 check and then c7 is a little bit under attack. What's the best move? It's supposed to be completely equal here, maybe king d8. Let's see what happens after we play king d8. Maybe not the best. What do you think? King f7. <laughs> Pete, why play the London? Be a man and learn proper opening theory. Hikaru to chess bro. Oh, did a man play the London system against Hikaru? Or did he just play it in some like regular blitz match? If king goes to f7, then queen c4 is a huge threat. So let's see. I think also, actually, this is fine. Because after queen c4, there's just, you give the pawn up, right? You play something like queen here. Oh, no, but then there's rook takes e7. Maybe, hmm. Ah, you go back. No, you don't go back. That's a lie. I lied. Maybe you just play this. And now you're defending on c7. No problem. And now there's no rook takes e7, there's no queen attack anywhere, things are perfect. And also, the best piece to blockade with is a knight. The worst piece would obviously then be a queen or a king. But the knight is doing perfectly fine blockading this isolated pawn. This is perfect. <laughs> I got the context. Attacking b7. But then how does the queen go to b3 here? Hmm. Okay. All right, so let's continue. 
So c6 was played. c6 was played. And of course, here it's already much better for white. So then we have d5. And this is something we need to know about the isolated queen's pawn. When you have it and when you're playing against it, there are obviously things you need to know. And I'm going to give you tips right now. This is the cheat sheet of chess. You can write it down. You can do whatever. You can just listen to me speaking. Doesn't matter. When you have an isolated queen's pawn, you obviously have the center. You also have quick development and what I'm assuming to be active pieces. You have to try and activate your pieces, put them on their most attacking squares. You're not going to try and have a, a very defensive position where your pieces are passive because the IQP is already a weakness enough. You have to take advantage or try to find some kind of compensation for this pawn. At some point, you can push the IQP forward, creating weaknesses in your opponent's camp, but also you want to try and remove the IQP. Why is an IQP so bad? It could be bad because the fewer pieces you have, the fewer defenders you have. Since it's an isolated pawn, there are no other pawns that can protect this guy. So you're going to need to keep your pieces on the board. All right, playing against an IQP, of course, you're going to want to put pressure on it. The best blockade for an IQP is a knight. Chucking a knight right in front of an IQP is not only going to be an, a great outpost for your knight, it'll also be centralized and it'll stop it from moving forward, which is exactly what white wants to do. Well, the person with the IQP wants to do. And uh, another thing you want to simplify pieces, because while you are swapping knight for knight, queen for queen, rook for rook, you are simplifying pieces and that IQP is going to become a lot weaker. And if there are no major and minor pieces on the board, the king can just go ahead and attack that IQP and it will become a problem for the party with it. And that is how to deal with the IQP. All right, let's continue. Okay, he took on d5 and then knight d4. Was it best to take? I don't know. Hey, Glamdring. <laughs> Every time someone says this is fine. What? Did I say this is fine? That, that after knight d5, it was fine. Get the knight into play and rip open the center. That's exactly what he did here. So not only getting rid of that IQP, but using it as a... Or maybe just evacuating the d4 square, right? You're not going to overthink it too much. King f7. King f7. Then we have 96. What a beautiful outpost. Rook c8. And already I feel like it's all over for black. Queen g4 attacking on g7. We have g6. Knight check. Don't we love this check because it wins the queen, right? If the king had to go anywhere else or take in a knight. <laughs> whoa, whoa, this is beautiful, guys. Oh my gosh, goodness, look at this, right? So rook takes e7. If the queen had to take here, yeah, then it's quite simple. We just take like this, take, take, and we are a knight up. And the knight can just simply come back because, of course, we have to watch out for back rank checkmate. And knight f3 protects e1, so no problem. All right. <clears throat> Melissa, good to see you. Mark Fine. Uh, my favorite one is the picture with the dog who's sitting in a room that is on fire and he's like, this is fine. This is fine. Like when you down a pawn or down a piece against a stronger player. This is fine. It's all okay. <laughs> Can anyone start chess at the age of 16 and become a GM? All right. That's a really great question. So I hope that you're still around for me to answer that question. Um, a couple years ago, I played in a zonal championship and I we made friends with a different team. They were from Angola and one of their players were the same age as me. I started playing when I was eight and I surely should be a lot stronger than I am now. I'm about 1819 at best is my peak and hopefully that's not where it stops. But anyway, um, this kid, same age as me, uh, he was raised at about 23, heading to 2400, 
and we were sitting there trying to communicate because of course they speak Portuguese and we were just trying to like find out who they were, uh, which city they were from, when they had started playing chess and we asked, well I asked the one boy, how old are you? And he said, okay, um, how old was I then? I'm 19. I said, okay, I'm also 19. When did you start playing chess? He said, um, uh, and he showed me four fingers. I'm like, oh, you've been training really hard for four years? It's like, no, no. I learned chess when I was uh, four years before this, when I was 15. And I said, wait, what's your rating? And he said, ah, oh, 23, 80 something. And I was like, casual very nice to know <laughs> and then i sat there i was like i'm 1800 i've been playing chess eight years longer than this guy has where did i go wrong and he said no he just he played in the correct tournaments of course he was trying to train really hard and he he played in the fide events that he knew he was going to gain elo but also he was training a certain number of hours every day because he knew what kind of goal he wanted to reach and that's what he was going after so it's not about how long you've been playing chess, it's how much effort you put into the chess or put into your passion the moment you begin. I can start doing something now and in 10 years perfect that thing or in five years perfect that thing depending on how much effort I put into it. So it's really, it, age just doesn't matter, especially when it comes to chess. Being a sport where you could just sit there with minimal resources and just improve is amazing. Unfortunately, I can't say the same if you want to start ballet. You will have to learn a lot of flexibility techniques in order to uh, perfect that at a <laughs> older age. <laughs> yeah, but hopefully that helps. Talent does play a role somewhat, but I would say that the effort and skill level or like the, the amount of effort and work you put into it is going to override talent at some point. Because if you're just pure talented and you're not putting any work, then it's not going to help. But it's nice if you're talented and you're a hard worker. <laughs> what, the, what? We don't bring those things in here, Cappy. If you're not a GM. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you very much. On not chess. Yeah. Of course. No problem. If it's motivated you, then that that was the whole goal. That was the goal all along. All right. I also know there are some comments on this position. So we're going to go back over here. Okay, so he didn't take, I thought he was going to take with a king. What happens if he takes with a king here? Uh, king takes. Then we have rookie one. Not rookie one. Rookie one. Not rookie one. <clears throat> rookie one. Let's play rookie one. And then king d8. And, ah, there's this move. Okay, we see it now. So let's come back. He didn't take. He plays king f8 and then rook f7, king g8. Whoa, he's just going after the king. Because after queen takes, like we've already discovered, I mean, <clears throat> it's just over. Right in here, he simply resigns. I mean, white got a little greedy and took that h pawn. He could simply just take the queen at any point in time, but decided to go against. Ah, oh, wait, 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 wait. He can't do that. He can't do that because, of course, there's mate. There's mate on c1. So what happens after king g8? After king g8, we have what exactly? Do we have... Hmm. Do we have check and then king takes queen, king? What happens here? Week 7th rank? <laughs> Photographic memory? I wouldn't say my memory is all that good. And I'm pretty sure that there are some memory techniques when it comes to 
learning chess theory, it definitely helps having a good memory, but I don't think uh, being an amazing chess player acquires a photographic memory. A king should lead from the front, except in chess. Hold that thought. There's a game with Nigel Short, and I'm going to go through that game next, um, but it's absolutely beautiful. And a chess baby. <laughs> He's star princess. He started three months ago. How's that going? After 30 years. No, but how much of those 30 years have you actually put into chess? That is the true question. All right, so let's continue. Um, we're not going to get through a lot if we just keep on stopping. And then after King G8, okay. Then, of course, Black resigns here and uh, White wins a beautiful game. So let's go through, let's go to the next game. I really want to go through that uh, Nigel Short game first. And then we're going to go to the Polymorphy, <laughs> Polymorph. Uh, did I save it? No, I did. He played? There's also a US Championship Brilliancy Prize played by Robert Byrne. And Robert Fisher. Steinitz? Where is this game? <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Okay, I didn't save it. Let me save it quick. <clears throat> it's between Nidal Short and. Let's try to find it. Because I was looking at it before my power went out. Nidal Short and Yantaman in 1991. And the game was called uh, A Long Walk Off a Short Pier. I'm pretty sure he saved that game. Am I blind? Mm -mm -mm. There we go. I am blind. Oh my goodness. Okay. Chilled. Relaxed. Nothing to see here. Okay. There we go. And I think with the, the Morphe game as well, um, when I checked it out, I thought that the computer had glitched because there wasn't a rook on A1. And I think that he was just playing rook odds and still won. Um, okay, so let me fix this now. Blind. So blind. Okay, let's begin. So Nigel Short played white pieces versus Jan Timmen. And this is dedicated to the comment that says a king should lead from the front except in chess. Watch the space, sir. All right, so we have e4, knight f6. Oh my gosh, we have the Alekhine's defense. Um, there's someone in the chess world in my community and he lives in a town called Judenhaeg which is about 45 minute drive from here. And for as long as I can remember, and obviously he's much older than me, so as long as he's been playing chess, he's been preaching this Alekhine defense. And upon my preparation against him, I played against him in 2015. It was near the end of the year. We played in this like regional championship and obviously he was older than me, much more experienced. I had, um, I still have so much respect for him and I was playing white pieces. I knew for the life of me, if I played e4, he was going to play the Alekhine. So at that point in time, of course, I was still an avid e4 player. And I even thought about playing d4. I was like, he's so good at the Alekhine. I don't want to go into his lines. Why don't I just play d4? And then I said, no, I'm going to do this. I didn't have access to the internet at the time. And I had this PDF. And this PDF was John Nunn's English opening book, this purple covered book. And I whipped it out of my laptop. I put the chessboard down on the carpet and I looked through the Alekhine lines. I'd learned, memorized in three hours, I'd memorized, I think, a whole page of main lines 
just to make sure that I had covered the basis of the alkyne. I had never really looked at it extensively before. But at the time, I mean, I was putting in a lot of effort when it came to, uh, you know, playing and wanting to do well because, I mean, the main reason I play chess, and I'm sure the main reason a lot of you play chess, is because you want to gain the respect or you want to earn the respect of your opponents. The better chess you play, the more respect you're going to earn. And of course, if you can outsmart your opponent by playing a decent game of chess, then they're bound to have respect for you, right? So that is what I try to do. And I think I covered, I think I covered enough because it, it gained me a draw. And after that, at every single tournament, he always had something nice to say. So, so that was, that was really, really cool. <laughs> and I kind of seems to gone off the boil as an opening these days wonder why i know some people have uh, started bringing the petrov back i know Karuana was playing that was he playing that in the world championship match or just after that maybe the candidates i'm not sure <clears throat> morphe played sometimes without f7 pawn rooks hmm I seem to have become a 95% chess watcher and 5% play. <laughs> oh my gosh, until you peak and it's a large grind. Unfortunately, um, at that point, I think that was the month that I actually peaked at like 1940 Fide Elo. Are you going to bring the Petrov back? Let's go. Okay, so we have the, the Alakine. D4, D6. Knight f3, g6, bishop f4, and then we're coming back with bishop b3. Okay, so I don't usually play it this way. Maybe sometimes I, I look at stuff like f4 and uh, playing that way. I know it's pushing a lot of pawns, but nonetheless, it's it takes over the center. You're going to give me the center, I'm going to take it. Thank you very much. I'm going to run with my center advantage and then completely lose the plot later on. a4. And my d4 taking, of course. All right, so we have rookie one, e6. Remember, this is Nigel Short versus Yantim in 1991. I can't remember the tournament name, but if you want to take a look at this game, it's absolutely amazing. I'm going a little bit fast here. b3. Oof! Giving away this kind of pawn chain and, uh, I mean, creating this weakness for yourself on purpose. Imagine that, just for a beautiful kingside attack, because here you kind of stopped black and his tracks from, from attacking on the queen side. In chess, it's all about um, seizing the initiative and then taking it home. And if you're attacking on one side and your opponent is trying to attack you on the other side, you have to try and stop their attack first before going on with your own. Unless, of course, you've castled on opposite sides. Um, which you after which you should still try to do that you should start to uh, try to stop their attack first but maybe then it becomes a race of who's faster um, but over here white has obviously um, taken into account that if he stops black's attack on the queen side that he's completely winning on the king side so let's see what happens here we have bishop e3 and queen c6 queen c6 hmm I play e4. What about you? <laughs> Playing chess is stressful. Watching chess is relaxing. But it's not great when you're watching chess and the person you're watching playing chess is stressing out, and that stresses you out. Unless, of course, you... you don't get nervous during a chess game. And I think the more chess you play, the less you're bound to, to be nervous during a chess game. Um, I found that during a lot of my games where I usually would be freaking out, I'm completely calm. And that comes with experience. Gotta flex that XP. <laughs> yes, Caruana played it in the World Champs vs. Magnus. Yes, I got it right. <laughs> yeah, I watched a bit of that match, or all of it, and then forgot about it. D4 is more positional for me. Yes, um, I was on the Chess24 stream, and we would... Um, we were discussing um, e4 versus d4, at least I brought it up, and then I mentioned that like e4 is more tactical compared to d4, 
and statistically speaking that is true but um I mean, you could get positional and tactical positions from d4 or e4, depending on how you play it. So it all depends. It all depends. There are always exceptions to the rule. Continuing here, bishop h6, removing, trying to remove the defender on the king side and rook d8. Bishop b7 and rook d1. Now the question is, how is this um, an instructive position kind of explaining how king safety is so important? And you're going to see, both of the kings are castled, but watch the space. Rook e7, rook f8, taking, taking, and we have rook d4. It's so nice to see um, when a player incorporates all their pieces. If we take a look at black's pieces here, good old Jan, I would feel like not all his pieces are utilized correctly, because of course if he wants to attack, this is pretty much the only pressure he really has. His rooks are not doing much. But if we look at white's pieces, Nigel has used both of his rooks quite nicely on the only open file on the board at the moment, and also using this rank. So he's defending the c-pawn with the rook. He can now, he frees up his queen. His queen can slide into f6. His knight can jump in at any time as well. And he's just using all his pieces correctly here. So after rook d4, we have rook e8, and check, there's the check, and h4. Here comes Harry the h-pawn! <laughs> oh my gosh, Ginger GM is a legend. If you guys don't know who Ginger GM is, I'm so sorry for your loss. <laughs> but now it's kind of awkward because you want to move the knight, but you cannot because that knight is the only thing guarding the g2 square, and we can't exactly move the g2 pawn because then we're going to lose. And like we said, the queen and the bishop are the only thing um, that creates hope for black at this point. And the knight is doing the position justice and protecting the only threat that's there. Ari! <laughs> hey, Lucas. No way, Glamdrang. That's cool. <clears throat> Excuse me, got so excited there. Oh, Joseph, you've seen the game? Okay, so let's continue. No spoilers. King g3. Never in my life would I ever consider bringing my king in to attack. But think about it. This king, if it made it all the way to f4, to g5, to h6, this is mate. And the question is, how does black stop this exactly? Is there an answer? <laughs> it's coming in, guys. Look at this. Oh my gosh. And his opponent resigns in this position. <laughs> oh my gosh. Looks like a short game. Um, It was 34 moves long, so it's not short. Um, But I, I see what you did there. Um, Yes, it was played by Nigel Short. But um, but um, for the small joke that I made. Anyway. Moving on. <laughs> yes, Melissa, the knowledge man. Nigel Short versus Jan Timon. Uh, can we put our, our hands together? All right. So next we are going to take a look at... Yes, we made it through that game quite quickly as well. Um, this is the one I wanted to look at. Called Open Rook File to Exposed King Morphe versus... Morphe. Nope, that's not the one. King in the center. This is the one. Morphe versus Morphe. Polymorph. 1850. 1850? Alonzo Morphe versus Paul Morphe. And already it shows that black is completely winning because of the rook odds on the on the board right now. So Paul Morphe is the one playing white pieces without a rook. All the moves are loading in. Oh, those are the evaluations. Alonzo. Is Alonzo his father? Hey, Neil. Awesome. Okay, so let's begin. All right, so we have e4, e5. And for Paul Morphy to have the kind of confidence to just go into the game, rook odds, I mean, I wish I could exude that kind of confidence in life. 
knight c6, bishop c4, knight f6, and knight g5. Here we have a fried lover, but that evaluation pain is not moving anywhere. d5. Normal. Taking, taking. And what's the move here? For those of you who play fried lover out there, what is the move you usually play in the fried lover? Either his father or his uncle. Well, here we have the names. I'm going to display them. Paul Morphy versus Alonzo Morphy. So you guys can tell me. Nice. Nice. Knight of seven. Losing against records. Is that your favorite chess player, Joker? I think it's one of your, f your favorite chess players, right? <clears throat> Okay, so we have knight takes f7, king takes f7, and queen f3. Naturally, we would not play the more aggressive looking queen h5 because there's g6. And if we come back, there might just be... Okay, king will move, but we don't want to allow g6 at any point. Why not just go directly queen f3? Then we have king e6, which is normal, and knight c3, putting pressure... And now we have knight d4, which you will not see. In a position like this, it's much better to play something like knight e7 or knight b4, after which I think castling is played or d4 is played, along with bishop g5, depending. Then over here to play a move like knight d4 already goes back the knight. And now that evaluation pain is definitely going to go up a notch. Not moving? How is this still winning for black? <laughs> okay, I see you. Okay, now we're somewhere. Now we're somewhere is completely equal, I think, or like slightly better for black. Queen f3, nice copy. Yes, got it. <laughs> Definitely his dad. Thanks for the research there. I didn't do the research myself. He didn't waste any tempos. That was Paul Morphy game of the century versus a Duke and Viscount, uh, the opera game played in the 1800s. If you guys haven't seen that, you must check it out. It was even um, one of the examples, but I didn't want to reuse that one because I already gone over it on stream. <laughs> Yeet. <laughs> okay, so bishop takes, knight takes, and knight e4. Then we have king d5. Now, let me check. I'm going to stop here again. And I'm going to let you guys, because I don't think I've given you a lot of thinking to do. I want you guys to come up with the next move. I've been speaking way too much. Let's go. In Paris. Yes. It was the opera house in Paris. No, I don't know, actually, Neil. I might have forgotten. It's been a while. A couple weeks is a while for me. <laughs> so many pawn moves. Yeah. Sure. Kappa. Kappa. So while I take a sip of my coffee. <clears throat> if you had to take Magnus Carlsen, Bobby Fischer in his prime, and Gary Kasparov in his prime and peg them together or just throwing them in a ring to have them fight for their lives. Honestly, I don't know who would win. But if Bobby Fischer was still alive and Gary Kasparov um, with his strength at the moment and Magnus Carlsen, I think Magnus would win. Um, Gary would come second and Bobby third. So there's a time in your life that um, biology kicks in, right? So if you had to just take all three players in the prime of their lives, I think you would find a different uh, answer. Bobby wins. I think he's probably... He has a mean left. <laughs> sure. C4. Nice. C4 is played. So C4 and king takes. King takes. What's next? Wait, you get into the opera game after like move seven? Jeez. So you're getting queen b3. Because I can 
I think I can recite the entire game to you. But that's a whole flex for a whole new day. So you guys need to give me the answer here. Nice. Queen f3 is the move. Oh, I thought queen f3 would be played for sure. But queen takes is played instead. Then we have queen d5. And I'll stop again. Oh, the last move, guys. Oh my gosh, I remember this game now. The last move. Let me see if I can do that again. e4, e5, knight f3, d6, d4, bishop g5, d takes e5, bishop takes f3, queen takes f3, d takes e5, bishop c4, knight f6, queen b3, queen e7, knight c3, c6, bishop g5, b5, knight takes b5, c takes b5, Bishop takes b5, check. Knight d knight b d7. Rook d1, rook d8. No! I got it wrong. No! Long castle. Rook d8. Rook takes d7. Rook takes d7. Rook d1. Queen e6. Bishop takes d7. Knight takes d7. Queen b8. Knight takes b8 and rook d8 checkmate. <laughs> what did we get? What? You had the f ready? Oh my goodness. Can you run? It wasn't this game, it was Paul Morphy's Game of the Century. Um, Alright, so the move here, of course, is d3. Then it's check. King takes. And oh my gosh. What's the move here, guys? What is the move? Thank you, thank you. Thank you. The bishop on c1 was a star. Spoiler alert. <laughs> yes, look at this. Can we just admire this? Castling and its checkmate. Who in their right mind? Okay, everyone in their right mind. Who in the world has been able to achieve this? OTB. On... A grand stage, playing rook odds, and the last move of the game is castling. Can we just... And it's mate. And it's mate. Wow. Alright. So I think we have time for one more. And I'm going to choose the one with the most interesting title for us to go through. <clears throat> Actually, you guys can decide. We have the immortal game of the century... Windmill Tactic, a Stranger Opening Lesson, a Queen for, for the King, Queen for the King, hmm. seemingly safe but actually deadly. So the Sh Nigel Short versus Timon game where the King ended up on g5, that game was called A Long Walk Off a Short Pier, which is funny because short. <laughs> don't shoot the piano man because it was a closed game open king by tar and you 1948 windmill let's do windmill i, I was gonna say the same thing actually because i really liked that game it was the first thing that i'd loaded in but i wasn't sure if it was um the best thing to start with considering the title of the stream <clears throat> nice windmill got it Nice current. Okay, so we have Donald Byrne versus Robert James Fisher. Bobby Fisher here played black pieces. So we're going to turn the board because I think Bobby won this one. Yes, he did. There are even some comments in the game that we can read together. Let me flip the board real quick. There we go. Alrighty, so let's begin. So we have Knight of Three first move. Why do you play knight f3? Knight f6, c4, we have an English. 
Okay, normal moves are now we've kind of transposed to a Grunfeld. But with bishop f4, nice pressure on the queen side for white. c6, e4, and this is terrifying. All right, so Barbie was obviously not phased by any of the, the central pressure here that white has. It's like, you can take the center. I will, I'll catch you later, you know. Okay, so keep in mind the windmill tactic. Um, I will stop. Right when the tactic begins, so you guys can follow or, or uh, decide what the move was there. Okay. So we have queen c5, bishop g4, and bishop g5. And this amazing move. Knight a4. How does this work? What happens after? Knight takes a4. Okay, so we have a comment before this move. Bishop e2, followed by castling, would have been more prudent. The bishop move played allows a sudden crescendo of tactical points to be uncovered by Fisher. So here, much better would have been bishop e2. But instead, bishop g5 was played. Oh, ho, ho, I see. So if knight takes, do we have knight takes e4? Do we have knight takes e4? Let's see here. I don't think they've added that. Knight takes e4, knight takes e4. Oh, knight takes a4, knight takes e4. And what does it say? And white faces considerable difficulties. What are these considerable difficulties exactly? Because we have queen c1. Ah, I see. So once the queen has left this rank, the fifth rank, then we have queen a5, things like this. See, the cool thing about queen a5 is that it's check, we're attacking the knight and the bishop. These are tactics I would even consider. This is creativity on a whole new level, guys. Okay, so we come back. So instead of taking on a4, which he obviously didn't do, he decided to play queen a3 instead. Okay, then we have knight takes c3, and now it's much better for black. And there's another comment. At first glance, white, one might think that this move only helps white create a stronger pawn center. However, Fisher's plan is quite the opposite. By eliminating the knight on c3, it becomes possible to sacrifice the exchange via knight takes e4 and smash white's center, while the king remains trapped in the center. <gasps> Poggers. Okay. Takes, knight takes, and bishop e7. Oof. Do we play queen e8 here? We play queen b6, even better. Then we have bishop c4. He does not take the rook. He was not greedy enough. What are these sacrifices? What is happening? Oh my word. Check, of course, king f1. And then we come back. Giving the queen? He takes the queen! What happens here, guys? Whoa. Wow! Oh my gosh! All right, so let's see. If this is the game of the century, then bishop e6 must be the counter of the century. Fischer offers his queen in exchange for a fierce attack with his minor pieces. Declining this offer is not so easy, because bishop takes e6 leads to a Philidor mate. <laughs> Smothered mate, right? With queen b5 etc. Nice, 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 nice. Let's continue. This is brilliant. Okay, I love this. This is game of the century? Great. Takes king g1. It has to be. Imagine being, being like on the receiving end of game of the century. Like out of 100 years, you played the best chess game. That is goals right there. Is queen d1 not made? Night Hunts. First windmill game. To ever exist? No way. <clears throat> okay, so now we begin. Let's start with the windmill, guys. How are we going to start? What's the, what are the moves? I need more than one move, though, because we all know it's 92. But what happens after that? What happens after that? Let's 
this tactical this tactical scenario where a king is repeatedly revealed to checks is sometimes called a windmill. You're changing your name to Bobby Fisher. <laughs> oh, nice. Me too. Can I be uh, Barbara Fisher? I will be Barbara. I don't like that name. You can still call me Bobby. My name is Jesse, but you can call me Bobby Fisher. Knight takes pawn. So if knight e2, knight takes pawn, nice. King back. Because as you can see, the king has to bounce between these two squares. And it will never be considered repetition. Because first of all, black is making different moves all the time. And also, repetition is uh, restarted after either um, a pawn is moved or a piece is captured. And there the pawn was captured. So in king back. And now knight c3 check. King goes back, and there we just have a normal move. And of course, um, taking the bishop, why is it not met by queen takes c3? And that's not possible because of the bishop on g7. Obviously saw that, just testing you guys. <laughs> then we have queen b4, rook a4 taking on b6, last hopes here. And there's so many pieces, it's overwhelming, completely overwhelming. King goes to h2, taking on f2 capture and queen check bishop back what is happening this is beautiful game of the century h5 95 okay then we have king g1 bishop check and we're reaching the finale now burn is hopelessly entangled in fisher's mating net Torlek, we're going to have some problems, aren't we? <laughs> Haven't seen a knight windmill before, you just see with the rook and bishop. Exactly, Landring or queen. But now what happens? Now I need the configuration of moves. I need the last couple moves. Let's go. <clears throat> My rating is 1800-ish. <laughs> hey, Piyush. Bobby Feb. <laughs> Knight check. Give me squares, Neil. I need the squares. Of course, all of the moves are checks. Because we're on king f1 right now. Let's say it's mates in f6. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. You guys finish off the game. And we'll call it an evening. <laughs> 9g3, nice. No, 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 93. Because you don't want to cover up the rank. The rank is uh, important for that rook. So if you play something like 92, then there's king e2, I think. King s gives. Maybe you can push it back, but right now you don't want to give. Yeah, 93 is the first move. And then, of course, king e1 is forced. What is next? So if knight g3, king e1. Bishop b4. King d1. e2 will be free, yeah? And then we have bishop b4, yes? King d1. So you're kind of just pushing the king in the direction you choose. Bishop b3, yes? Bishop b3, king c1. Come on, 1900 glam drawing, let's go. Not bishop a3, because now we have to use our least active piece here. So we have a bishop on b3, we have a bishop on b4, we have a rook on a2. And there's one piece we are not really utilizing because we left him behind. Nice. 92 is not made yet, because king can still go to b1. Yeah, this is what happens when you take a nap with braids. <laughs> Luigi. Sorry, who's Luigi? I'm new here. I pulled a Luigi on you. 
Yeet. Knight c3. We have 92. 92. King b1. Yeah. <clears throat> Check. <laughs> yes, good. Knight c3. Check. King goes back, right? King goes back and then. So many arrows. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, I literally just said that, Cappy. I didn't even <laughs> read your comment. <laughs> oh, my gosh. One more. One more, guys. One more move. Because now you're covering D1. You're covering B1. You're covering this rank. You're covering all the squares. Uh, no. Maybe. Maybe that's mates anyway, right? No, but king goes back. No, the king can't go back. Then that is mate. Then there's two ways to mate. Okay, that's good. Many ways to Mars. Let's go. Knight g3, king, bishop b4, king, bishop b3, king, knight e2, king, oof, knight, king, and rook c2. I guess this is also fine. Like, you can play this. It's mate. So many ways to mate. Yeah, bishop a3 works just as well. Rook c2. And glorious checkmate. What a way to end off an amazing stream. And uh, guys, this is very important. The bottom line is keep your king safe, please. Do it for your honor. Do it for the respect. And most of all, do it for the chess. <laughs> awesome. So if anyone here is playing in the World Schools uh, online chess tournament, good luck. And hopefully these kind of training sessions are helping you on your way to success um, here for the for the banter, of course, and all for the, the chess training. But I'll see you guys really, really soon. And uh, yeah, just check out coachess.com if you want to learn more about us. Cheerio, guys.